campus this summer. A couple of uh, <coughs> assumptions that we go, we're going through uh, and, and background on this project. Um, planning is central to improving population health. Public health planning is central. You don't know where you're going unless you plan to get there. You don't know if you've gotten there uh, or when you've gotten there or how well you've gotten there uh, without uh, operating on a plan. There are a variety of uh, uh, planning uh, efforts in public health. Uh, in, the, in Texas, for example, uh, in 2008, we began with Active Texas 2020 uh, with the sponsorship of the Texas Governor's Council on Physical Fitness. Interestingly, <coughs> Active Texas 2020 predated the United States Physical Activity Plan, uh, and Texas and West Virginia are still the only two states with a, a standalone plan. Uh, we're in the process, as I indicated, of updating that and moving towards Texas, Active Texas 2030. Um, and our goal is to bring the state plan and translating it to local uh, uh, levels more in line with the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan. Um, and a, a, a key feature, the perhaps defining feature of the National Physical Activity Plan is that it uh, takes a societal based sector approach and each sector uh, has developed strategies and tactics and objectives uh, that are evidence based and evidence informed uh, about how to move forward with showing real uh, uh, progress in promoting physical activity. These webinars uh, are meant to include ideas and opinions from stakeholders. Uh, the overarching theme of Active Texas 2020 and one we're carrying over uh, to Active Texas 2030 is that all health is local. Uh, taking what uh, is uh, at, at a national level and uh, blindly applying it to situations such as in a, a Texas Panhandle, rural areas, or El Paso uh, to Brownsville along the U.S.-Mexico border, or urban areas such as Houston and Dallas. Uh, everybody's different. Everything's different. And so uh, we're trying to engage as many people as possible at many different levels uh, as we go forward to, to, to make this plan a local, uh, locally appropriate plan uh, for Texas. There are 10 sectors uh, in the, the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan. Uh, we've gone through most of these in our webinar series, and today we're focusing on uh, the sector that's labeled community recreation, fitness, and parks. A very unique uh, set of uh, uh, settings, if you will, a unique setting, societal sector setting. And I am just tickled to death because uh, Dr. Deb Cohen has agreed to join us and, and present the webinar today. Deb is a research scientist, Dr. Cohen is a research scientist at Kaiser Permanente. Um, uh, research and valuation in California and has been a leader for many years uh, in this area, uh, advocating, uh, studying, uh, um, researching uh, other kind of things, writing about the role that parks, community recreation, fitness play. And she also, in addition to our other job, she also serves as the sector chair uh, for the National Physical Activity Plan. So. Dr. Cohen, welcome, uh, and uh, we're extremely grateful for your uh, time today and your expertise. Um, and you have the uh, you have the microphone. Okay, let me see about sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. And uh, I will see say, it now. yeah, we can see it. Be great if you could put it on full uh, uh, full presentation mode. It'd be great. Um, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, the problem is it it's somehow shifts. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. We, we can see it. Yeah, I would say to participants, if you uh, do have questions as we as we anticipate the question and answer period at the end, please let us know. Uh, post them in the chat box uh, on the WebEx, and uh, we'll be able to get to worse them. Worse or better? If I see, I can you see it now? The full yeah. thing or no? Yeah, no, it looks good. Yeah. Okay. And okay. You, see, All you see the full screen, right? The uh, the the uh, I, logo is a bit cut off. The head of the okay, person so jumping is a bit cut off. Okay. Let me just go back to off. the other one. I think the other one is better. Uh, oh, how do I? Sorry. 
Uh, oh no, I think that was a mistake to go to this full one because it, cha you know, I have two monitors and it changes it. Let me, let me go back to, sorry, this is not, oh no, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. You don't, what you see right now is, uh, let me just, let me just do it one more time. Somehow it's not working here. Uh, okay, you try it one more time. No, this is not working here. That was a mistake. Sorry. One second. Why is this not showing on my monitor? Yeah. Okay, let's try it again. Um, okay, do you see it now? Yes, perfect. You are seeing it now? Yes. All right. Um, it's weird because I'm not seeing it very well, but you see, it says physical activity plan and it's yes, the, we see the entire, the entire image in the slide. Okay. All right. Sorry for the <laughs> lengthy fixing this up, but yeah, so I'm with the, um, uh, community recreation, fitness and park center. And what I wanted to do today is to go over what our strategies and tactics are. And then talk to you a little bit about, uh, what people in our committee are working on. And also I was gonna share some of my recent research, which is exactly in this sector. So um, I'm a, a research scientist and I've been actually studying uh, parks and physical activity for almost 20 years now. Um, okay, are you, are you seeing it the full screen? Okay. Um, anyway, so what is the contribution of the community sector? Well. I mean, it's really what we are all around us every day. There are over 100,000 outdoor public parks and recreation facilities, uh, about 65,000 indoor facilities. And the research to date is showing a very strong relationship between programming, having facilities, uh, having them available and accessible and higher levels of physical activity. And so this is really, I would say, the most important sector <laughs> in the National Physical Activity Plan. And uh, it's really important that, you know, our everyday surroundings, that we have a context that supports physical activity. So there are five primary strategies in this group. Um, one is to enhance and develop new resources. Another is to improve the availability to them, to all different groups. Um, another is to uh, increase more staffing with more recruiting and training. Another is to increase advocacy. And then the last is to also to ha and continue having monitoring and evaluation so we can continue to refine and improve um, our facilities and programs. So um, strategy one uh, is really about more and better resources. Uh, communities should develop new, enhance existing community recreation, fitness and park programs that provide and promote healthy physical activity opportunities for diverse users across the lifespan. And uh, so the tactics include, you know, first see where you are, have some evaluation so you know what to improve, and then to look at the literature and see what are the evidence-based programs and interventions that you could bring into your community. Uh, there's another one about um, in combining it, working with the medical community. Uh, there's the park prescription programs where uh, healthcare providers are recommending outdoor activity, just spending time in nature, going to parks as part of the treatment plan. Um, and uh, the last one is to make sure that we have, you know, some equity and uh, make sure we're serving everybody equally. Um, the second strategy, increasing availability, and communities should improve availability of and access to safe, clean, and affordable community recreation, fitness, and park facilities to support uh, physical activity for all residents. 
And so here the tactics are uh, rehabilitating and upgrading the existing uh, um, facilities. Um, one is to build new ones uh, and to also work with nonprofits to increase, you know, the number and the accessibility of it. Um, partnering with other um, groups uh, and also really making sure we maintain the infrastructure that we have. Um, the other issue has to do with just, you know, our everyday uh, city streets and sidewalks and so on to make sure that uh, people can access the facilities. Um, then also to have more agreements like with schools or other organizations so that they have facilities, you know, why not make use of them? Uh, and to share things uh, to, with the whole community. And then, of course, making sure that people are safe and secure because um, safety is certainly a barrier in many communities uh, to even being outside. If, if people are afraid to go outside and use these facilities, then what use is it? So safety and security is important as well. Um, the third strategy has to do with training, staffing, and leadership. Uh, we you know, just can't have the ideas. We need people to be there to uh, lead them, to implement them, and to advocate for them. And so the strategy is community recreation and park organizations, the fitness industry, and private business should recruit, train, and retain a diverse group of leaders, staff, and volunteers to promote, organize, lead, and advocate for initiatives that encourage physical activity in their communities. And so for this strategy, tactics are uh, more education, increasing physical literacy among uh, just the general public, but especially uh, encouraging future professionals. We need more leadership and more people in this area. Um, we need to have uh, best practices so we can educate and have people with appropriate credentials. So, you know, we, you know, people who are out there and leading things, you know, have expertise and people can trust them and rely on them. So we want to make sure they have the appropriate knowledge and skills. And then, of course, we need advocacy. So we need some um, advisory panels uh, and, you know, get more people involved in, in many ways uh, in all the aspects of um, having physical activity resources and uh, staffing. Um, the fourth strategy, advocacy, is, you know, really focusing on this in particular. Um, park, community recreation and park organizations, the fitness industry and private business should advocate for increased and sustainable funding and resources to create new and enhance existing physical activity facilities and services in areas of high need and in all areas as well. Um, I don't know if people know that we spend very little in this country on parks and rec facilities um, compared to what we're spending to take care of people who suffer from being physically inactive all their life. Um, I think I have this later in the talk, but it's, you know, we're spending like over $10,000 a year per person on healthcare. We spend less than $100 per person for physical activity promotion and, and parks. It's, it's just absurd. So we need partnerships that'll increase and uh, protect dedicated funding for community recreation. We need to find other sources of uh, funding. Um, you know, government should be a primary source. Uh, so maybe tax incentives uh, could help. Uh, we need to figure out how to build capacity uh, in communities where they don't have um, much capacity, uh, but there's a high need. Um, and then we need to um, fund, uh, have funding for things like trails, uh, facilities, playgrounds, and then we have to uh, think, have establish a, an, a council that really works to try and get funding and to promote the development and creation of um, all kinds of facilities um, and working across different, uh, you know, organizations, state, local, federal. And then the, the last strategy evaluation, and of course, this is one of my favorites since I'm a researcher, but um, community recreation and park organizations and the for and not for profit fitness industry should improve monitoring and evaluation of participation in community based physical activity programs to gauge their effectiveness in promoting increased levels of physical activity for all. And so, yeah, we need to evaluate the campaigns. Do they work? Should we repeat them? We need to understand the design and the construction of facilities and if they make a big difference or not. 
We need surveillance just to see how things are going and if our efforts are making a dent in improving physical activity. We want to see associations between uh, our facilities and, you know, our built environments and uh, physical activity outcomes. And also look at what private business is doing. Are they making a difference? Are they more or less effective than some of the government programs? There, there's so much, you know, evaluation that can be done to guide um, future directions. So now I want to just move to giving you an example of, of some of the activities that our, our, um, our uh, committee members are involved in. And I don't know if you've heard of Three Wins Fitness. It is a program that was established by Dr. Stephen Loy at CSU Northridge, where he has kinesiology students doing internships where they offer free exercise classes in low income communities in their local parks. And they offer these 60 minute exercise like three times a week to all ages and groups. Um, the students get together and they bring all this equipment and they lead these classes. They're incredibly exciting and dynamic. Uh, they started out just with CSU Northridge and then other universities and colleges have been adopting it, but it's, it's a program that's still not very well disseminated, but it has great potential. And uh, one of the advocacy things is that we're trying to see if we can get other universities and colleges to have, you know, internships where they actually serve the community by providing these classes. So um, another thing that we're doing is trying to write commentaries and um, pieces to advocate for more uh, funding and, uh, you know, different uh, resources. So one of the pieces that was written uh, talks about um, how the how different colleges and universities invest in physical activity programs. And it turns out they spend way more money on student athletes and sports facilities, which are restricted just to these athletes and the, the, uh, the typical college student can't even use them. So uh, the idea was to call for, you know, having more sharing of these facilities, more equitable use of resources. You know, they spend multi-million dollars on facilities um, and, you know, shouldn't they also devote money to the typical students where they actually need to continue their physical activity, stay healthy. And just an example was there were like 20 football coaches in this country altogether are getting $130 million a year. While our CDC division of nutrition, physical activity, obesity, they only have a budget of 109 million and that's for the whole country. So, uh, you know, I have to think about like, where are these resources going and shouldn't there be some way that more people can be served instead of focusing on just an elite group of people. So that was one commentary. Uh, another commentary was about uh, funding. So what happens is that programming in parks is really dependent on local tax dollars. And when communities don't have as you know, that much local tax dollars, they offer fewer programs. Now there are federal programs, but they currently focus on the facilities and capital improvements. And there really isn't any federal funding for staffing or programming. When research shows that it's programming that attracts more users and gets people more active. And so we should think about, you know, having the federal government change its restriction from capital improvements to also invest in staffing and programming. And as I mentioned earlier, it's like we spend so much on health care after the fact, after we let people get sick instead of spending a little bit more on prevention. Right now we spend less than $100 per person uh, for uh, funding parks, local parks and recreation. So that, that was another advocacy piece. Another one is on uh, electronic media. Well, it turns out that, you know, electronic media has been growing and growing and growing. And along with that, sedentary behavior is increasing. And in fact, over the past few years, we are like an hour more sedentary than we were before all of this electronic media. And so one of the recommendations is, well, at least the electronic media, and since they're reaching more people, what if they did nudges and like between, between streaming episodes, they said, oh, time for your 10 minute exercise break. And, uh, and look, if they did that two, three times a day, people and people did like these 10 minute breaks while they're watching TV, there's people are watching TV or, you know, electronic media four or five hours a day. 
they would meet their physical activity guidelines. So uh, it'd be nice to somehow get them to somehow mitigate the harm they're causing by keeping people more sedentary. And then they're making a ton of money. Uh, maybe they should contribute more to supporting physical activity programs. So that was another advocacy piece. <laughs> And then, of course, we need more research on programming and, you know, like every community, maybe there should be like a, you know, a, a minimum amount, you know, so that at least people have something that they can access that would help them be more active. But we don't know what that is. So we need more research on that. And I know one of our committee groups was trying to look and see what is, what would that entail? Like, how do we actually you know, have a, a document and inventory of what's available in every community, and then we can potentially look at trends, but that kind of work hasn't been funded yet, but it's, it's a really an important research question. And so what I wanna end my presentation with is a little bit of uh, the work that I've been doing. Um, I had a grant from NHLBI to study playground design and physical activity. And so we call it the National Study of Playgrounds. And um, what we did is we selected six playgrounds in each of 10 cities across the US and half of them were traditional design playgrounds and, and half three were, you know, three were traditional, three are innovative design. And the playgrounds were all renovated in the past 10 years. So they were all in very good condition and comparable. And then we observed the use of the playgrounds by visiting them over one week and we had different observation protocols. So one of them, we just, you know, divided the playground into different target areas and we counted everybody in that target area. So a systematic counting of people and where they were and who was in that area. Another one we called dwell time is we just basically observed when did people arrive at the playground? How long did they stay and when did they leave? So we just watching people just to document how long they actually spent there. And the third one was we called play loop where we just watched uh, different people randomly for eight minutes and we just watched how they moved through the playground to see what areas they used the most. And so we've just, we collected this data last year, so we're still analyzing it, but I'm gonna just share you some of the early findings. We also looked at the playground conditions and their characteristics. So these were the cities involved, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Houston, Memphis, Chicago, Cincinnati, New York, and Boston. So six playgrounds in each of those cities. And one of the things we found, this was really, this is really exciting. We haven't published it yet, but we interviewed uh, playground users and we asked them how often they went to the playground and how long did they stay? And then where did they live uh, in relation to that playground? And we found that, you know, people say, okay, you need a playground within a half a mile of where you live, but so seeing what that means, if you live a half a mile in a, uh, if the, these people lived a half a mile, they visited four and a half times more often, and they spent three times as much time in the playground compared to people who lived more than a mile away. So this, this idea of having a playground, um, a park within a half a mile of, of home is incredibly meaningful. You're, you're talking about way more physical activity uh, because of that. Um, so here's just a picture of some of these innovative playgrounds in the 10 cities. And uh, just to give you an idea of what is an innovative playground like. So they basically don't have that traditional post and platform structure. They have more open ended. They include nature. They have different surfaces. They have like loose parts. Uh, they could have um, staffing and programming. This is um, adventure playground in Irvine, California. This is um, another um, uh, innovative playground. Um, and here's a traditional post and platform. Basically, it's just a structure that you sort of direction, you climb in, you climb off. Uh, these are, uh, I think this one is in Houston, the first one, and the one on the right is in New York City. Uh, here's another traditional post and platform playground. And another one, this one is in Boston. Anyway, we found that an innovative playground design attracted two and a half times as many visitors. Now, a lot of that was explained by the size and the features. These innovative playgrounds were about twice as large as the uh, traditional ones. And some of it was also explained by location because some of them were in these sort of tourist destination areas. But when we uh, sort of uh, account for all of those, we found that many features explained the greater use. 
So for example, swings, for every additional swing in a playground, there were 6% more users. And you know, with more use, there's more modern to visit literary physical activity as well. For every climbing feature, there were 4% more users. Um, for we looked at the trees and the shrubs. So when you compare a playground with mature trees and shrubs, you have these five categories. So the, the least is there's very few trees and shrubs, they're immature. And so there's a scale. And so we found that for every increment on the scale, there were 26% more users. So, you know, a, a, a park with mature trees and shade would have like double the users as one that didn't have uh, a lot of trees and shade. We also found if there were restrooms, 44% more users. So that's important. And uh, picnic tables, 9% more users for every additional picnic table. So uh, that's sort of the main and immediate findings that we have to share on that study. Uh, there's gonna be more to come. But in summary, uh, there's a lot of work that's needed to improve community resources that support physical activity. We need to spread the message of the importance of physical activity and the risks associated with physical inactivity. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but it turns out that if someone has been inactive, they're uh, inactive most of the time, their risk of dying from COVID is about two and a half times higher than someone who has routine physical activity. So if you're not active, you, have a, you live shorter, you have more chronic disease, you develop more problems with tasks of daily living. So it's, it's really important and I don't think it gets the kind of attention and respect that it deserves. So we need more funding, we need more respect, we need a lot more advocacy and promotion of resources to support physical activity. Thank you very much. Uh, that was fantastic. It's such a privilege to get a look at your latest work and, and, and uh, uh, some of the things that you're finding out uh, in the park study. It's really an ambitious undertaking, uh, Deb. Uh, okay, we're, we've got some uh, questions and answers. Uh, if you have a question, please, uh, or we have lots of time for questions and answers. If you have some, uh, please post in the, in the uh, chat box and we'll be able to get to you. But to kick things off, Deb, uh, you putting your hat on as the sector chair and maybe not as a researcher, but um, you know, this is this is a very important uh, sector. We all live in it uh, in various forms or fashion, from uh, driving by a park <laughs> uh, all the way to using it and being active in a park frequently. Uh, uh, one of the things we're trying to do with Active Texas 2030 is to give tools to people who are in communities. Um, and this is a huge undertaking, obviously, putting a new park in within a half mile of every place is uh, uh, challenging in some places. But from the strategies and tactics that your group has put together and are monitoring, what would you say is the lowest hanging fruit for someone, say, in Amarillo, uh, who wants to take some, uh, put some effort towards improving uh, access to parks and fitness and community uh, based resources like you're studying here. Yeah, I, I think the leadership is really important. You know, I don't know the mayor, the city council people. I mean, I don't think people appreciate the importance of physical activity. They always think that it's, you know, extra, you know, it's like something they can cut the budget of and it's not going to cause a problem. Like, you know, they won't cut fire, they won't cut, you know, police, but you know, having, but understanding how important it is, is, it makes a difference. And so if you don't have a leadership that's, a, that understands that, um, you know, you're just not going to get anyone to support, you know, putting budgets or advocating for more parks and rec staff and facilities. And so it's important to elect people or appoint people that understand the importance of physical activity. So that gets to, and a lot of the advocacy uh, uh, priorities that you put together uh, or you, you, you've labeled in the fourth strategy, I think. I meant to say uh, there is an email at the bottom of your email address at the bottom of your screen, activetexas2030 uh -huh. at uth.tmc.edu. And if anyone on the 
here uh, has additional comments or questions, that email goes right to me and I'm happy to, uh, to take that uh, uh, engagement and move forward. I did see uh, Dr. Marshall is in the room. Um, she posted a question on, uh, uh, on, on your distance idea. Allison, you wanna, you have, can you open your microphone and? Yeah, absolutely. So I was curious um, that half mile distance is uh, interesting and relatable. I was wondering if you saw any patterns on how people would go to playgrounds, you know, were people driving, was parking a factor? And did you see any strategies for active transportation to get to them or, or how to encourage that? Yeah, so again, the, the parks that were closer, people generally walk to them. Um, so yeah, if you want active transport, the car park has to be close. It's an interesting observation. You're not only studying the location and the distance, but the quality of the, the facilities. Yeah. You know, often just in a, a in a, a anecdotal sense, when we studied the new Miller uh, Airport redevelopment, uh, took the old airport and put housing and so forth in. They put some of those quality, uh, innovative designs into the park, and I would go and I'd interview people. Uh, just uh, by chance to learn more about why they're there. And people were driving across the city uh, to, to, to come to this park uh, yeah. that, that had the innovative infrastructure and so forth. Yeah, so, so we found that too. So the innovative parks, people were coming, were more likely to drive there and they were coming from longer distances where, but the, but really the most important predictor of the park use was the distance from their home. So, you know, people would come, but they wouldn't come very often. They would go more often to the parks that were close to them. Allison, do you, do you have any uh, thoughts on encouraging the active transportation instead of driving to a park? Yeah, I think the, um, of course, the innovative park features are a draw, but I'm also thinking of some community work that we had done um, in Austin and we went in with a bunch of ideas about uh, access to healthcare services and, and we had all of these sort of preconceived notions, but um, the residents talked about um, poor state of sidewalks, um, sidewalks that just discontinued, not having stoplights uh, for the walkways that they needed um, and, and even things like trash and not enough trash cans so litter and so it was an unpleasant or unsafe place to walk so um so i think those infrastructure pieces um, and the advocacy pieces is, is really important um, in that case we had we were able to talk to parks and rec and they said um to request additional trail maintenance for some of those um areas that you know people wanted to use so i think the having it like you like you mentioned having it feel safe for people to be outside and feel safe getting to the parks is uh, is important for that active transportation piece one of the other findings that I, I didn't put in the presentation is that we looked at the impact of the playground design on poverty uh and neighborhoods that are high in poverty so in general neighborhoods with high poverty, they use the parks less than in neighborhoods where it's low poverty. Um, so when you had an innovative design, it reduced the gap that redu you know, reduction in, par um, in playground use by 60%. So uh, the design made it more attractive, maybe made people feel safer uh, in low income neighborhoods. That is so interesting. One of the things that, that, that I'm reminded of, it's happened in those of you who've been to the other uh, webinars we've had this summer, uh, I'm struck by the need for uh, cross-sectoral uh, collaboration. Uh, parks don't exist in a vacuum. You need to engage the transportation system <laughs> to get there, uh, whether it's by road or sidewalk, uh, the, the parks, um, Department, if you will, community parks department in a city isn't responsible for the sidewalks leading up to the park, right? 
And so that's transportation, uh, the city transportation or other, <coughs> excuse me, uh, other department. Um, and so even though the national plan has a sector based approach, understanding the interaction among sectors uh, remains to be a challenge for those of you who might be uh, interested in making changes in the community, um, understanding the system that all of us uh, interact with every day um, to use these resources uh, seems to be important. Uh, and, and to um, if it's a safety issue, then that, that seems to me to be a, an issue around um, uh, public safety, uh, engaging police and other kinds of things, lighting, uh, <clears throat> a variety of things that uh, can, can, we can emphasize towards better park use. Uh, Deb, I wanted to, to pivot a bit a little bit. One of the things that uh, uh, is, is frustrating for me in this area is we promote park use and so forth. Uh, you can still be sedentary in a park. Uh, yeah. and, and, and there are a lot of uh, adults who will go and put the chair down and let the kids play, uh, which is great. Uh, <laughs> but you've got a ring of adults around the, the playground uh, who are sedentary. Are there, are there strategies or tactics that you might yeah. suggest? I mean, originally we had hypothesized when we were comparing the designs of the innovative and the traditional playground, the innovative playgrounds are built actually to accommodate adults, many of them, and they have wider slides so adults can go on the slides and be on the equipment with the kids. But uh, we actually uh, did not see a difference in the in the whether the adults were playing or not in the sample that we had. But definitely, you know, making the uh, playground designs uh, so they that they could, if they wanted to um, participate, it would be um, helpful. But you know, even just getting to the park, like getting there, getting outside, is a value. Uh, they have to walk to the playground area. Um, we did see a lot of parents following the kids around. I mean, some are sedentary, but not all of them. And then just being in nature, you know, being around green, you know, being outdoors that has mental health benefits, you know, so. Uh, if there was more programming um, where they get involved, um, that could be helpful. We had a few playgrounds. We haven't analyzed it yet that had um, fitness equipment around the playground areas. So we can check to see if that made a difference. If more adults would be using those, I, I doubt we'll see anything there. But, but again, it's like, there's no staffing. There's no, nobody encouraging offering programs where they get, you know, all kinds of people to participate. I mean, that's, that's a big problem. I mean, our other studies showed that if you have a program, it increase uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity by 60%. So uh, we just don't have the staffing and the funding to really uh, support activity in the um, extent that we need to. So it seems making that a priority and going back to your original thing about leadership and and education is 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 comes back to the low, lower hanging fruit, I guess. <laughs> uh, your original comment. Uh, another comment here, uh, Melanie. Uh, are you, can you open a microphone? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. you sound great, Melanie. Yeah. So um, I am actually a part of It's Time Texas and. We do offer um, free physical activity classes throughout. Um, we started pre-COVID in the Austin area in person, and these classes were held at various community um, parks and rec centers, um, some parks, um, and other community centers around the Austin area. Um, and really, it started as um, Stronger Austin started as a community-based initiative. Um, to uh, overcome some of these barriers that a lot of people were experiencing. Um, and we've uh, really been seeing some amazing feedback on um, from the in-person classes, but also now that we're virtual, um, now being able to reach a wider audience, especially those people in the rural areas um, as well. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we are hoping to be able to provide these types of programs um, in person outside of the Austin area to really grow our impact 
Um, and we are starting a little bit of um, that in person um, engagement through our partnership with Austin Parks Foundation right now. Um, so offering a limited amount of in person classes again um, at certain parks um, in the Austin area. That sounds great. That's really a wonderful program. It'd be great if you could be a model for <laughs> all the other cities in the US to adopt it. Absolutely. Yes, that is definitely our goal. And um, we actually have many people outside of Texas that attend our virtual classes because nothing like this is offered within their area. So are you marketing? I mean, it'd be great if you could, you know, let everybody know across the country if it's virtual, right? If anybody. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, besides our usual um, partnership outreach and engagement um, within Texas, within our, our partnerships in Texas, um, we also promote on social media um, through our pages and also um, through public uh, event platforms, such as like Eventbrite, Meetup, um, and other website uh, event platforms like, such as those. That sounds wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to learn more and maybe talk about featuring that in, as part of the, the Texas plan uh, revision, Melanie. Um, I'll, uh, I'll go to the website there. Uh, incidentally, this is being recorded and, and the, the recording and the presentation will be available on the Dell Center website uh, uh, shortly. You know, that reminds me, one of the things that got cool some years ago was for-profit uh, fitness classes in public spaces. Uh, when when um, the iPhones became ubiquitous and, and uh, cell phones and <clears throat> geolocation and so forth, um, fitness trainers would uh, have a business that they would go to various parks and have early morning um, fitness classes and so forth, which I thought was great uh, if you, if people could afford that and there's more opportunities. However, municipalities started to crack down on that because of potential wear and tear on parks, creating another barrier uh, so that it was illegal. Uh, I think it still is in Austin. Maybe Melanie, you, you can help me with that, but I think it still is in Austin to have uh, a fitness class where uh, there's a leader and you use a city park to have a 60 minute workout. Uh, so, and and yeah, I'm wondering if you've heard of that around the country, Deb, and any thoughts about how to overcome yeah. it? Yeah, so I can tell you, I live in the city of Santa Monica and um, what they have is a program where all fitness leaders and coaches have to uh, register and pay a fee to hold classes in the parks. So uh, they give them some breaks if they allow, um, if they do some free classes, but um, they feel like it's a business and they're just, you know, not paying their rent <laughs> on the place. So uh, they allow it as long as they register and pay uh, a fee for their use of the space. I see Melanie uh, has weighed in in Austin. You have to have a permit, which is the same idea, I guess you have to pay for the permit a little bit. So yeah. or pay a little bit for the permit and that helps offset the wear and tear costs, I guess. Um, <clears throat> another question, uh, we've got, uh, I guess, 13 minutes or so uh, in the hour, Deb, one of the things, again, <clears throat> uh, oh, well, someone posted here. Uh, uh, Oscar, uh, you want to, you if you can open your mic, please go ahead and join us. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Good morning or good afternoon. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to take it back off of what Maggie was saying. Uh, Ma Ma Maggie or Ma Ma uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That's I'm sorry, Melanie. I forget. Melanie. Melanie, sorry. Yeah, we also work with low income poverty uh, or, uh, you know, marginalized communities as well too here in Austin. Uh, I'm with the Expanded Food Nutrition Education Program through Texas A&M AgriLife. And uh, basically we teach them about myplay.gov. You know, basically it's uh, the adult classes go uh, six to eight weeks. And we also have a youth component as well We go where we go into the Title I schools and, and teach them about, the, you know, basic nutrition as well too. And that goes about six weeks. 
And each class lasts about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And what we do is we're looking for behavioral changes. So we'll ask for like a food diary or food recall on the initial class. And then on the last class, we also ask for the same information and we're trying to see if they've increased their fruits and vegetables and maybe decreased uh, their processed foods and uh, they uh, see if they've uh, increased their physical activity as well. Whether that be through stretching, mobility, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, we also give them like a resistance bands as well too. They they can take home so that they can also practice. So, you know, being a dietitian as well too, I honestly can say this program's really, uh, it's well put together. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not just saying that because I work for them, but you know, if I <laughs> didn't know them and I allowed them into my uh, into my workspace, I would, uh, I would be happy. I would that I would have done so because, uh, you know, the program is, is, is well structured. Uh, and like I said, we do offer like an incentive items or enhancement items. And it's here in the Austin community our Austin area, but we also have, them, you know, uh, like down in the valley uh, in El Paso. Uh, we have them in Tarrant County or Dallas County. We have them in, in Cameron County as well, too. Uh, I mean, uh, West's County, I'm sorry, by Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty much all over the state of Texas and, uh, you know, we do offer great services. So, uh, you know, I included my email in the, in the chat. So if you guys are interested, you guys are more than welcome to email me and, uh, you can see how we can work together. That's another great case study. I think Oscar, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, and, and speaking on what you were saying about, you know, uh, where there's more crime, it's it's a little bit harder to get physical activity. Uh, you know, I grew up in a place like that, similar, and it, it, you know it was tough. Um, but like you said, I mean, just because you go to the park doesn't mean you're going to be active. It's really up to you, and you got to take initiative to want to be active and get active. And how do you do that? You know, and that's another another topic. You know that you you can get into as well too. Is that, you know how do you go about getting fit or getting healthy? So, uh, Dr. Cohen, one, one additional question. We, we typically, when we think about systems, we think about barriers. We also think about accelerants. Is there, is there any magic pixie dust <laughs> that you, that, uh, we can, we can, we can sprinkle on a community or with, uh, give to community leaders to, 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 to grab that low hanging fruit and, and, and develop and, and encourage, uh, uh, maybe uh, prod uh, nicely the leadership uh, uh, to, to 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 put more emphasis in parks, more make them more of a priority. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is sort of cultural. Um, when we we did a national study of neighborhood parks, and we looked at um, twenty seven cities across the country, and uh, at we you know monitored their parks, and then we got to look at what their policies were, and we saw. We did, we did a, um, a study in 2014 and then again in 2016, and the overall trend across the country was the, a decreased use in, in parks. And uh, there were exceptions. So we looked at some of the exceptions and it turned out like one of them I remember so well because it was um, Westminster, Colorado. They were so creative in uh, the kinds of programming that they were offering. They had started this uh, rumor that there was a monster in one of their lakes uh, where there was a park and that monster was laying uh, eggs on the trails. And so then, then families would come and take a walk to look for these eggs that they had uh, made with, you know, sort of they blown glass, had these glass eggs on the, tr on the sides of the trails uh, that kids could find. And then they even had like, uh, monster poop <laughs> had like uh, some colorful rainbow poop or something, but it was it created so much buzz and it increased the use of their facilities so much. And then they had very creative programming for adults. They had something like do uh, ballerina dodgeball, and so people who played dodgeball they had to wear a tutu, and then when they you know whatever stopped the music or something they had to uh, stop in a ballet pose. So it was like so, so much fun and so interesting that they just attracted so many people. And so like having a very creative uh, leadership that makes physical activity entertaining and appealing and attractive, like this programming is really what makes a huge difference that gets people out of the house. You know, you have a cyclovia, you have a 
you know, event, a dance, you know, all of these things are what draw people outside. And so it needs support. It needs creative leadership. Uh, and, and that's really what's going to make a difference. And when you have that, then the community is going to support it more. And they're going to say, yeah, I'll pay more taxes to support that. So you need to, it's like a, you know, a, a cycle. We, you need to get it started uh, to get people excited and interested and really make their days. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be fun. Well, it sounds to me like the takeaway, <clears throat> if I may, uh, not to oversimplify this because it's incredibly complicated, but uh, for, for people wanting to help make this a priority in their community leadership and programming. Uh, and programming would come from leadership because you need support from that leadership. So uh, those, uh, if, it's, if it's the elevator speech, uh, it seems to me I'm going to walk away from your presentation today. Leadership and programming are the two kind of critical things that uh, we should be focusing on for not just <clears throat> parks and safe parks, but physical activity within parks. Uh, and and uh, that's I think two really good messages. Out of the comments or questions, uh, we've still got uh, about five minutes or so uh, wrap, to wrap up for uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, I'm certainly not against ending early if we don't have anything more to talk about. But this has been extremely helpful, I think, Deb, and and very useful to focus on this uh, particular sector. Uh, it crosses. So many um, socioeconomic status categories. It crosses race, ethnicity. It's inclusive, uh, as it should be, and uh, it's uh, important to get these ideas out, uh, uh, out and discussed. So I do want to thank everyone. If there's no, oh, oh just thank you, uh, thank you, Allison. Just uh, sending platitudes and thanks. We do very much appreciate your time and your busy life, Deb, to join us today. Uh, again, if anyone has any uh, questions or comments or would like to share more uh, about how to what's going on in the Active Texas 2030 planning, please drop me an email at ActiveTexas2030 uh, at uth.tmc.edu and uh, happy to, to visit more. I do appreciate uh, Melanie and Oscar uh, talking about their experiences and highlighting their, their work in and around Austin and the state of Texas. Thank you all very, very much, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Deb. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.